Hi, and welcome to episode 413 of Control Talk Now, Smart Buildings Video Gas and Podcast. My name is Eric Stromquist, and we talk about all things HVAC and smart building controls, including sales and marketing. So with all the talk about AI we've been hearing about lately, how is it affecting cybersecurity? That's a great question. And our guest this week is going to help us answer that question and give us an update on cybersecurity in the smart building to control space. It'll be along in a few minutes, but a couple of things before we bring our guest on. As I mentioned on last week's show with the new website, we're no longer sending out an email every time we make a post. The good news is I'm not cluttering up your email inbox. The bad news is you got to remember to go to Control Trends to stay up to date. But I came up with a kind of a cool solution, which is I've created a weekly newsletter called the Control Trends Briefing. So once a week, I'll send you a briefing, top post on Control Trends, as well as other useful information you can use. For example, a lot of people ask me about how to use ChatGPT. And let me tell you, it's a great tool but it's all about the prompts you use. So in addition to the other information I'm gonna send in the newsletter, I will always, I will be sending out a weekly chat GPT prompt that you can just copy and paste into chat GPT and take advantage of the power of that cool AI interface. So for example, in the last edition of Control Trend, the Control Trends briefing, the prompt that I, I gave you allowed you to enter the URL of a company's website, and ChatPT would do a complete competitive analysis of that company. I mean, it's incredible. It gives you the strengths and the weaknesses. It's an amazing tool. So be sure to sign up for the Control Trends Briefing, and I'll put a link in the show notes for you to do that. My promise is I'll never send you spam or share your information with anybody else. And also, if you've been to the redesigned website, you know we're offering a place for our sponsors to place banner ads. One of the cool things about the way we're doing it and the service we're using is that once a month, if you're an advertiser, you'll automatically get an email report showing you how your ads are doing. It's a really, really cool add-on. I think you're going to really like it. And for those of you who have already signed up for ads, the website developer is in the process of checking out the plugins to make sure that everything functions as promised. Uh, You'll start seeing the ads appear in the next couple of weeks. But uh, for anyone who's already signed up, you will not be charged for May. So uh, thanks for your patience. And speaking of sponsors, let's have a quick word from the sponsor of this episode of Control Talk Now. So I want to take a moment to to mention this company that's been instrumental in the success of Stromquist and Company. Our sponsor this week is McKinney's. They're a full service mechanical contractor that's been shaping the skylines in Atlanta since 1948. My dad did business with McKinney's back when he got started in 1952, and we're still doing business with McKinney's. And I can tell you from personal experience, McKinney's is a company founded on the principles of integrity. They they take care of their employees, their customers, and their vendors in an age where taking the easy way out is kind of accepted. But McKinney's can always be counted on to do the right thing. Kenny stays ahead of the technology curve, offering the best in new construction, retrofit solution, and building automation controls integrations. With an in-house, with in-house shops and over seven decades of experience, they truly are the top choice for mechanical systems which deliver quality and performance. What will really sets McKinney's apart is their commitment to improving the lives of their customers, employees, and communities. They've always treated us like family, and their proven approach ensures high-quality solutions at every stage of a building. I can personally attest to their quality work and commitment to excellence. So if you're in need of a mechanical contractor or building automation controls integrator that builds a better future, choose McKinney's. To learn more, visit their website, mckinneys.com. And uh, as I like to say about my friends at McKinney's, they're shaping skylines and building futures. The office is in Atlanta and Charlotte. Man, these guys rock and roll. They're friends. They do a great job. Check them out. So if you want to be a sponsor of an episode of Control Talk Now and be seen and heard by the global Control Trends community, just click on the link in the show notes and I'll make sure to get you hooked up. And now I'm pleased to introduce our guest. All right, man, I am so excited. An old friend is back in the Control Trends house today. His name is Fred Gordy. If you've ever been a fan of Control Trends for a while, 
Fred has been on a bunch. He is, among other things, a cybersecurity expert, an all-around good guy, and he has been with a new company for a bit. So, Fred, welcome to the show. And, man, tell us where you're at now and what you're up to. Well, first off, thank you, Eric. And I'm going to say glad to see you back, man. This is, Thanks, brother. This is pretty cool. Uh, so, yeah, um, I moved to Michael Baker a few months ago. and uh, But before that, when I was first toying with the idea of making the move, because I really – you know, I really appreciate Intelligent Buildings, and they're a great company, and it was a hard decision. But Michael Baker, um, just real quick, a little bit about Michael Baker, because I didn't know this before I came on, is Michael Baker has 3,500 employees, 100 locations around the United States. Um, they've got presences overseas, um, 16 different practices, and a couple of them that are kind of the, quote, cool factor is we have over 100 drone pilots who interact with our LIDAR guys, the guys that go in and, I mean, I'm sure the audience knows about LIDAR. So we've got a whole mapping group that does uh, that kind of thing. We do smart transportation. We do um, military, DOD, three-letter agencies. We've got um, hooks in a lot of top-secret stuff, and it's just it's been a, a learning experience for me but it's and a growth experience. And so, anyway, it was a it was a difficult decision to make the move over, but I'm glad to be here, and I, I I just can't wait to tell people about what Michael Baker can do. Well, uh, man, I'm so excited. Yeah, and and, I, I, and you know, I'm with you. I mean, the boys over at Intelligent Buildings are great. You know, Tom and Rob and the whole crew. So oh, yeah. I know that was a difficult decision for you, but uh, dude, it seems like you've moved from a world of you know we used to call them what black hats, white hats, and gray hats to. Uh, now you probably got hats that you can't even talk about that you're involved with, huh? Yeah, it's, um, you know, I mean, my role at Michael Baker is to develop uh, anything that is not federal or government. Um, but I still get privy to that information. And, you know, it's, uh, it, it is a, uh, a scary world out there. I've always, yeah. now I'm kind of able to see a little bit further into the, what's going on and um, you know some of the stuff that our other cyber guys are involved with is just fascinating to me we've got one guy who this I can talk about but his his job is to def come up with strategies to defend uh, nuclear vehicles and uh, you know rockets and that kind of thing so that's some, that's pretty serious stuff but, oh yeah but uh, yeah, yeah for sure well Fred you know, obviously, Michael Baker's huge. And like you said, um, I haven't heard of him too much vis-a-vis -vis our industry. So is that part of what what your mission is? Yes. I, and if so, let's talk about that. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> you know, some people know me, but very little of in our industry know who Michael Baker is. And so what I'm doing is is trying to contain myself with because I do have excitement about everything that we're able to do but um, I want to focus on a message that basically introduces the fact that Michael Baker has got expertise in um, over 82 years of expertise in aeronautical mechanical electrical they do control design work um, the kind of control design work they do is in nuclear power plants and, and that kind of stuff or we do um, but anyway is to try and introduce our industry to the capabilities of Michael Baker and to be quite honest with you I'm still in molding phase so I want to take this opportunity to invite people to tell me what it what is it that you are looking for because I know that we've got the capabilities to do pretty much anything needed in this industry because, you know, I've been in it for 23 years, so I know what the industry it looks like. But Michael ba Baker, um, the talents and abilities at Michael Baker are just now being scratched the surface in our world, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, it does. And for our audience who might not know, I mean, Fred, you know, started out as a, uh, as a systems integrator, worked for McKinney's here in Atlanta for quite, quite some time. And I think you started their cybersecurity department, if I'm not mistaken. But when Fred says he has a lot of experience in our industry, he does. So for our integrators out there or building owners that are watching, 
I mean, Fred really understands the nuts and bolts of cybersecurity as we know it today. And what I hear you see, saying, Fred, is, hey, there's, there's, there's a lot more that can be offered, which I'm assuming would mean that it would protect the integrators and the building owners even more than we're being protected now. Absolutely. And fair statement. It, very, very correct statement. So with that in mind, you know, <clears throat> a couple of things is my counterparts are very knowledgeable and I got a lot of respect for, a, a, you know, a lot of different people in the industry. However, the point of view that I come from is, like you said, the integrator and the end user. So I'm trying to look at things from not just a perspective of cybersecurity risk, I'm looking at it from a perspective of operational resilience. Okay? Because to me, that's an... Go ahead. Hang on, hang on. Unpack that. Okay. Because I think you just said a whole lot. And it's like I hear the words and I'm kind of going, I think I have an idea what that means, but, but I have a feeling that there's a lot in that statement. So if you would say more, I'd appreciate it. Absolutely. So, so Fred got an education as I grew in the cybersecurity field. So the reality is the building owner, what do they care about? They care about keeping the building open, keeping everything running, and everybody happy, right? So I started thinking about that. It's like, okay, I've been kind of going at this the wrong way. Is it really about cybersecurity, or is it about making sure that the systems stay functional and operational? So that's a great distinction. Yeah. So when I approach things, it's from an operational resilience. And what that means is anything that we do or any recommendations that we make should do several things. And one is the obvious from a cybersecurity perspective. But when you put the policies and the processes and you put the, you know, updates into the systems and you get them functioning more securely by default, what you're going to do is you're going to actually create a, oper- a much more operational, resilient system. So at the end of the day, the, the building only cares about the event and the aftermath, not what caused it. That's what yeah. operational resilience is. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. So, but you also couple with that with, you know, hardening the, the so that it doesn't happen again, right? Exactly. Yeah, gotcha. And then the other part of operational resilience, there's a thing called an incident response plan. Okay, well, everybody associates that with cybersecurity. But the reality is in an incident response plan, there's a lot of steps in there that are talking about, you know, monitoring the systems and everything. But then there's also the point that when the event is over, you go back and replay, why did this happen? And how can we do better next time? And that applies even if a piece of equipment breaks down. What did we miss? Why didn't we see this coming? What could we do to prevent it? So, in human error, because that's going to happen too. So, if you're thinking about it in terms of this is all about the event and the outcome, does it really matter whether it's cybersecurity or operations or whatever? They all have the same agenda, right? Well, that, that makes a lot of sense, and it seems like it's kind of more inclusive. I know one of the things that you, I think um, Intelligent Buildings is, and you did, was you know you would try to go get all the stakeholders mm-hmm. on the same page. And I could kind of see where, you know, maybe the IT people are all about, let's get this cybersecurity thing done, and maybe the operational people are going, that doesn't really affect me. It seems like this approach, everybody's got a stake in it, right? Because it, the ultimate goal is to make sure that the building functions properly. Well, and and that's a good point, you know, um, and I've done this for years is I sit between IT and the OT guys. And so IT has a good agenda, which is to make sure that everything is okay. OT wants to make sure everything's up and operating, right? Yeah. But there's a problem that happens when IT kind of jams down the throat OT this is what we have to do. This is how we have to patch. This is, you know, on and on and on. And I'll never forget, I had a, a conversation with some IT guys after I reviewed their policy, and they were like, you know, we don't need another patching policy. We have a patching policy. And I said, okay, let me ask you this. If you were to take um, System X, I'm not going to name any manufacturers, and they are running a version that can only run on, say, Windows 2000, and IT comes in and updates it to the latest server version. I asked them, I said, have you done anything? And they're like, well, I I don't know. And I said, exactly. 
Now what you've done is you have to now get the manufacturer's latest version and load it on the, the server. But the downstream of that is all the devices that are in the field may not be able to talk to that. So now you have to look at updating the, the devices. Then you find out there's not enough horsepower in those devices to update to the latest version. So your patching effort just cost your OT guys six months of work. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, and not only, yeah, absolutely. Well, and is this partially, Fred? You know, I know this was the type of thing that you know you inherently, because of your background, would just know about and bring to the discussion. But is this also because you mentioned that you know um, Michael Baker was you know, had a whole control design type thing? Are they designing building automation controls as well? <clears throat> well, as a matter of fact. Um, Michael Baker is a, if you, if you really unpack Michael Baker, it's a culmination of, culmination of a lot of different businesses, if you will. And one of those is we have a, a company right now that will remain nameless, but they are controls in, in our world, Eric. You know, they, they, they work more in our world. Well, we, we acquired them, and they're coming over, and they are controls and commissioning guys. Perfect. The we do have a controls group, but they are very, uh, like I said, they do nuclear power plants. They do, you know, things like I was talking to the guy and he said, we have to take into consideration, like in a hot zone where you're passing, um, you, you got one of those little slide drawers where you put stuff yes. in and slide it to the other side. Well, you have to take into consideration the amount of air that goes through the screw hole. Oh, wow. And I'm wow. like, you got to be kidding. He said, no, that's wow. it. So what I'm doing is we're trying to move. Uh, some people use it, the term. We're trying to move it to the left of the design, meaning back to the beginning. So it's an internal education with Michael Baker. But these guys are smart. So as I've been working with them, they, they, you know, they catch it just like that. They understand because they do control systems for some very sophisticated System. Yeah, yeah. So, so the understanding and the nuance, probably the understanding is great, but also the nuances, right? I mean, you know, they, they, they <clears throat> probably can look at things that most of us might might miss. Um, so, Fred, look, I mean, walk me through your idea. I mean, because you, you see both pieces of the puzzle. You know what Michael Baker's capable of. Mm -hmm. You know about our industry. In a perfect world, let's just say that your missions, you know, and, and it seems like part of what you're doing is you're trying to educate our side of about what Michael Baker's capabilities are. Mm -hmm. So let's just assume a year from now we're interviewing and Michael Baker's gone through the roof. Your start this your first statement is Eric, everything got accomplished. We need to get accomplished this year. Here's what happened. Mm -hmm. Walk me through how it looks if Michael Baker's fully integrated into our solution sets. Okay. So, you know, obviously we have to take two parts. One is right. The brand new, the greenfield, and the other side is legacy brownfield. Okay, so obviously people are not going to just start ripping out everything and just going all new. So the very first thing that I teach people is, is you know, we before we do any kind of cybersecurity activity, we need to look at your risk profile. And you're, it's all a business decision, right? So what Michael Baker, uh, the, what Michael Baker offers to our world is we can help you in your design phase to make sure that when you get done that it is operationally resilient and it doesn't cost a much extra to do that right because all you're doing is you're just you're not really changing things i mean you're not really adding things you're changing how you might implement it then on the brownfield side it's all about we're going to help you make decisions about is does this system make business sense to try to bring it up to date but if it's not a it's not a big risk then maybe you put that on the back burner but now okay you've got this one over here that's uh, um needs to be addressed asap so i say all that to say this michael baker's primary focus is in the design but we also we want to work through with everybody what is your risk profile? Then you make decisions about, do, do I do this? Do I do that? And for the long time, when I first started, I was starting here when I should have been starting and encouraging people to really take a look at how they are configured 
And then which systems and buildings need to be addressed in what order? So you get a pro- you prioritize things just to, you know, you break it down to bike size. That makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. So it sounds like it's a <clears throat> lot of what you were doing before, but different than what you were doing before, right? Yeah. Um, so maybe, maybe a way to phrase the question would be, so somebody hears this and building owner or whatever, and they go, yeah, I want to talk to Fred Gordy. So they reach out to you. Mm-hmm. I mean, walk us through the process of how you would engage with them. And I think that might give us a good, good indication of, um, you know, some of the things you guys bring to the table as well. So one of the big things that I offer in it being in at Michael Baker is a basically a consultation that that it doesn't cost a dime. It's let's let's talk about it. Let's take a look. I mean I've got and when this is over, I've got a call in just a few with a guy and we're gonna spend an hour or two going through what he's doing now. And I'm going to make some recommendations, and it's not um, it 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 allows somebody to instead of I hate to say this, I mean you know we're all we are in business, but at the same time I want to be able to sit down with somebody and really take a hard look at what they're doing now, and then go ahead and tell them where you're lacking, and let them make the decision of what they want to spend on. I'm not going to go into a full on here's here's the statement of work let's get busy i'm not going to say a word till we start so that's that's a big thing and it's really being able to open up that way and uh, and talk to people you know sometimes people walk away and say hey appreciate the advice you know we're going to go do our thing at the end of the day that's fine too no, the way I kind of look at it it's like you go to you know this would be great if it was like this you go to your doctor and it says i'm charging you $500 $500 to talk to you about what's wrong. It's like a free consultation. Imagine if you went to your doctor and said, okay, Fred, this is what's going on. Mm-hmm. Here are your choices. And, you know, you can walk away now and not do anything. It doesn't cost you anything. Or option A is this, option B is this. So if you want to feel better, I can do that for you, right? Exactly. And that's the approach that we take. That's a, that seems like a really fair approach. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, I definitely, anybody, you want to give me a call, reach out. <laughs> that's uh, We can have a conversation. Well, I'll definitely put your contact info in the show notes so people can have that. So, uh, but, but, you know, again, one of the things you were always great at, Fred, you always were able to give our community, you know, here are three things to do to harden your system or three steps you need to be taken. I mean, I remember one of the earlier ones that I think still holds true today is, you know, you better have a plan. If you get hacked, this is our plan. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, I'm guessing if they go with you guys and somebody holds you up for ransomware or something, you just get one of those drone pilots to go in and take them out. And that's that, right? So (laughs) I I didn't say anything. I didn't say anything. No, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. But, but do you have any, you know, if you, you know, what you know now, give me two or three things that you would recommend to the systems integrators and the owners that maybe you didn't know before to suggest. They're real easy, and this is, I mean, it's the, the, the three things that you've got to ask yourself or take a look at, be honest with yourself, is what do you have, how is it connected, and who has access? I mean, if you look, I don't care if it's NIST, ISA 62443, the, you know, the CFF, any of this stuff, if you look at them, they all have those three primary components. Because if you don't know what you have, you don't know if something gets on there and it shouldn't be there or, you know, whatever the case. If you don't know how it's connected, then that means pretty much you're not going to know when somebody connects to you because they may have gotten in through it public or whatever the case may be. And then who has access? Eric, you know this. I mean, we've done assessments and you go in there and there are people that left the company six years ago. Their user is still in there. Right. So there's more than that, but if you know those three things, and and another thing that I would say, if you don't know what a tabletop exercise is, you need to do one. And what if you're not familiar with what a tabletop is? It's a it's a basically you sit down with the stakeholders and you say, okay, here's the scenario: we just lost the chillers, and we saw some, you know, the 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 VFDs were spinning out of control or whatever the case may be. What do you do? Mm-hmm. And then you walk through the steps so that you are prepared. Now, obviously, you can't come up with every scenario, but if 
if you be, if you create some muscle memory for response, yeah. that's the thing. You know, don't freak out. Don't start doing this. Don't and I can't tell you the number of people who have damaged the forensics information because they just got a little bit excited, and so now when you do call in somebody to try to figure out what happened, there's, there's destroyed the evidence. Yeah. Well, Fred, God, I'm loving this conversation. I'm gonna I'm gonna hit on a couple other topics sure. real quick. Um, one of them I want to talk about is, you know, because uh, we were talking before that cybersecurity is not just about necessarily somebody hacking your building or ransomware; that it goes farther than that. Mm-hmm. And before we started the show, I, you know, I kind of asked about. Uh, we hear a lot of concerns about, uh, let's just say, a social media uh, video platform that's from overseas. Mm-hmm. And, and I guess my question for you is, uh, how nefarious is that? And, and, and if you were a country and you were going to do something and infiltrate somebody through a social media platform, what kind of things could you do? And how dangerous is it? Mm-hmm. So before we go into you know whether something is uh has holes in the background you know back doors whatever to get to you we are a a society that posts when they what they had for breakfast so no matter what the social media platform is we're posting stuff on there about our life we're telling people what we're doing uh who we work for some cases, they get an idea how much money you make, you know, where you go on vacations and that kind of thing. Your political affiliations. Yeah, your political and- affiliations. All of that information can be used against you. There's a book called The Perfect Weapon, and in there they discuss this particular subject, and it's, it's about how a bad guy can take that and actually infiltrate your life. Um, I've got software that I run periodically um, that its whole job is to find out who you're connected to, what you're doing. Uh, you know, I mean, they're, if I have it, the bad guys have it. Yeah. But the platforms themselves, um, you know, you can argue certain ones are worse than others. But what I would say is, you know, I try to keep everything on a professional level when I post. Uh, I try to make sure that you can't, you you know about my work life, but you don't know about my private life. And there's a reason for that. Um, But quite frankly, I treat them all as they've got holes. I don't, I mean, you could say some are worse than others, but I mean, the reality is your data that you're posting is going somewhere and it doesn't go away and it Get, the bad guys can get it just as easy as the good guys. So maybe what I'm, you know, because I've studied a lot of social engineering and, and psychology and that kind of stuff like that. It seems like maybe the bigger threat is they collect the data and then, they're, then they know how to influence people. And then maybe, I mean, I think we've seen this a lot in this country. And, you know, what's going on really before social media with Google, right? Everybody's sure that they're right because they Google it not realizing that Google figures out what you like and serves you up things to support your opinions. Right. Mm -hmm. So everybody's an expert Mm -hmm. and everybody, because of, because of Google. So it, I mean, I could almost argue that we see all kinds of social unrest that you could probably make a case has been engineered by people overseas through our social media stuff. I mean, you know, just very subtle, benign stuff, but you just keep hammering, pushing the right buttons. Right. Right. And there's, you know, we were kind of talking about this before, but one of the things that I didn't bring up is <clears throat> to that point. I don't know if you've ever heard the term click farm. I've heard quick bait and jail bait, but I have not heard quick farm. So, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you just derailed me, man. Sorry, buddy. No, it's all right. It's good. It's good. So, uh, uh, there are these things called click farms and you can go out and make money there are people that make money by just clicking and so uh if i'd say take a time take time and anybody's listening and look up click farm and you'll see videos there's hundreds of these phones on the wall okay and you are given an agenda to post and each one of these phones has a fake account a fake email a you know a fake life if you will. So what happens is if I want to promote an agenda, I can hire click farms to post out information. And then what happens is the narrative will begin to get shaped. And, you know, people, I'm, 
I mean, the reality is when you get a herd of people, they become a herd. Yes. So when you start to see that the herd is going this way, and that herd may be a click farm, and that herd may be six guys in Korea, North Korea, who are just doing, you know, uh, say 600 to 1,000 phones and making it appear to that this agenda is a reality. Yeah. And then the herd comes along and just gets on it. So, yes, and in that book that I referenced, um, Perfect Weapon, and then there's also a video on Netflix called The Great Hack. They talk about yeah. shaping the narrative and shaping the message. Well, you know, and it is, I mean, you and I both have probably read The Art of War. Oh, you know, yeah. It goes back, you know, and uh, mm-hmm. I mean, in World War One. I mean, every war, I mean, disinformation is, is probably your most prevalent weapon. But, you know, Germany, I mean, their whole deal, they, you know, they, they busted Lenin out of jail, put him on a train, gave him a bunch of gold and sent him over to Russia. And within three months, there was an over, overthrow of the government. Mm-hmm. So it's not unrealistic to think that, you know, we have enemies in the world. And it's not unrealistic to think that uh, creating social unrest is, you know, dirty trick number one. So... Um, and then I think everything, Fred, and I want to ask you about this as we begin to wind down, everything gets compounded now with all this AI stuff. So speak to me about that and how you're seeing that show up. So, And that might be a show in itself, but maybe a 10,000-foot view. Sure. So to give you perspective, um, ChatGPT was released in November. Uh, the 1st of December, there was a guy who knew nothing about programming, and he was... Well, he basically spoke malware into existence. Okay. But it wasn't quite right. So he posted it on the dark web, the code that he did through chat. I mean, chat GPT wrote it. Okay. The guy, uh, some guy on the dark web saw it and he said, well, that's good, but here's a couple of things that need to be done. (laughs) And within, within, Three weeks, two weeks, the way I like to say it is somebody spoke malware into existence. So that's the power of chat GPT or these AI platforms. Well, I'm I'm sure that the the, the White Hats, people like Michael Baker and everybody else are using that same power to to, you know, counter Mm -hmm. counter that. So it's but but it but it's an interesting, interesting game uh, that's being played there. And there was one I read about the other day where somebody he put it out. It was like you know he gave the instructions, to, you know, to go destroy the world, mm-hmm. essentially. And I mean, it it didn't have it down, but you know there were some pieces there. You're kind of going, all right, this is this is a bit scary. So, uh, but but so, do you see sort of cyber cybersecurity maybe expanding or breaching out? Do you see maybe Michael Baker having like an anti AI division? <laughs> Listen, yeah, I've been doing this long enough in cybersecurity. Nothing is beyond possibility. And, and yeah. you know, Eric, when I first started off with, with you, I remember people telling me, Fred, you're pushing rope uphill. Nobody cares, whatever. <laughs> Nobody's going to do this. Nobody's going to do that. I got story after story after story of all of those things that I heard coming to fruition. So to we, if if the need is there, then... I would I would say that we would get there, for sure. Cool. Well, listen, let's let's uh, let's wrap it up. Uh, is it MichaelBaker.com? It's M Baker I T N L dot com. Okay, M, M Baker. And I'll warn our audience right now. I mean, it's, the the site is a bit daunting because Michael Baker does a <laughs> lot of stuff. So maybe check that out just to get an idea of just all the different pies these guys are into, but my suggestion would be reach out to Fred, right? And Fred, um, email they can reach you at? or Yeah, it's fred.gordy at mbakeritnl.com. Cool. I think I can find Fred on LinkedIn, oh, yeah. too. You usually stay pretty active on that as well. So. Yep. Uh, Fred, I just cannot tell you how much I appreciate it, man. It's so good to catch up with you. Listen, let's, let's try to make this a quarterly thing or whatever. Absolutely. I mean, this is moving at such fast pace. But, man, thank you for taking the time to speak with our community. Well, tonight. as always, Eric, I'm humbled and honored to be on your show. So thank you. Okay, that's another week on Control Talk. Now your Smart Buildings video casting podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. Remember, be bold, stay in control. Sign up for the newsletter. As Hunter Thompson used to say, buy the ticket, take the ride. We'll see you next week.
control